It was almost the perfect murder. At first glance, Martin McNeil is living the dream. A prominent doctor, a leader of the Mormon church, and the proud husband of a beautiful wife and father to a large loving family. But it's all an act. Nothing about Martin is what it seems. Kind of like the movie Catch Me If You Can, but with more lies, murder, and craziness. Let's recap. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris. I just want to take a second to thank you for letting us bring you all the crime in half the time every week. Whenever you give us a thumbs up or share our channel with a friend, it keeps us going and we're truly grateful. Thanks again for your support. Now on with the recap. Michelle McNeil spent her last days blinded by bandages covering her eyes, hopped up on a cocktail of strong prescription pain pills. The former beauty queen had just left the hospital after getting a facelift she thought might save her crumbling marriage. At 50, Michelle was just as beautiful as ever. She didn't want the surgery. It was her husband Martin's idea. He told her to consider it a present for her 50th birthday. What do you get the woman who has everything? Michelle and Martin McNeil lived a picture-perfect life. In the 29 years they'd been married, they raised eight children, four biological, four adopted. Martin was a bishop, a pillar of the Mormon church, and the money he brought in as a successful doctor allowed the family to live in a beautiful house in an upscale gated community in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Life was good before it wasn't. At 22, Alexis McNeil was studying to be a doctor just like her father, but on April 10th, 2007, she was home in Pleasant Grove for spring break. It wasn't exactly the relaxing study break she'd been hoping for. She'd been acting as her mother's nurse for a week ever since the surgery. But spring break was over. It was time to make that five-hour trip back to Nevada and med school. Alexis had classes to attend, but she couldn't escape that weird feeling that everything was not okay. The day after Alexis went back to school, Martin showed his face at work, then picked up his youngest daughter, six-year-old Ada, from school. When they got home, Martin told Ada, go find mommy. While he went to the kitchen, the little girl ran through the house screaming, mommy, 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 but the only answer she got was silence. Ada ran into her parents' bedroom, but Michelle wasn't in bed. Maybe she was in the bathroom. In that excited, no-knocking way that kids do, Ada swung open the door to a sight that would haunt her forever. Michelle was face down, fully clothed in a tub of reddish-brown water. Ada screamed for her father. Martin told her to go get a neighbor to help him get Michelle out of the bathtub. Then, in a bizarre series of 911 calls, he either hung up on the operator, or at one point, he angrily screamed, I'm a physician, I've initiated CPR, before hanging up on her again. It was so weird, the operator saved the calls for years to use in training sessions with new dispatchers. Right after Martin and Ada got home, his son Damien and Damien's girlfriend Eileen arrived. Martin had a hunch his wife had overdosed on her medication and passed out in the bathtub. He couldn't stand to look at the bottle, so he asked Eileen to flush the pills down the toilet and throw away the bottles. The medical examiner said Michelle died of a heart attack. The police reports ruled it an accidental death by natural causes. Alexis was one of the last people to hear about her mother's death. She rushed home to Utah with a knot in her chest. She couldn't shake the feeling her father had killed her mother. Michelle Summers was a popular beauty queen and part-time model from California. Growing up, the two things she loved most were family and God. At 21, she couldn't wait to start a family of her own. She met the man of her dreams, 22-year-old Martin McNeil, at an event for young Mormon singles. But when she brought him home to meet the folks, she didn't get the excited reaction she thought she would. Her family wasn't big on Martin's cocky attitude. There was something about the guy that rubbed them the wrong way. They didn't want their beautiful daughter anywhere near him. Like Romeo and Juliet, Michelle's parents' disapproval only made a relationship with Martin that much more desirable. He wasn't the creepy narcissist they thought he was. No, Michelle saw him as an ambitious go-getter, recovering from a traumatic childhood. When he put a gun to his head and threatened to end it all if she ever left him, Michelle agreed to marry him. They ran off and tied the knot in secret in 1978. The honeymoon didn't last long. Michelle spent the first six months of their marriage alone while Martin was behind bars. Before he met his new bride, he forged $35,000 worth of 
of checks and went on a bizarre spending spree. Besides the usual stuff like jewelry and clothes, he bought a grandfather clock, 60 pairs of socks, a refrigerator, and strangest of all, a year's worth of chocolate-covered cherries. Why'd he do it? For much the same reason mountain climbers scale Everest because he wanted to see if he could. He got the idea after watching an episode about forging checks on 60 Minutes. Martin thought he could do a better job. The bad checks weren't the first thing Martin McNeil ever lied about. He made up nearly every aspect of his life. Lying was the thing he was best at. It's hard to tell how far back the lies go. Martin McNeil and his four brothers and sisters grew up dirt poor in Camden, New Jersey. Some say he tried killing his mother as a kid, but help got to her before he could. Others say his brother's suicide was actually Martin's first successful murder. We do know that at 17, he lied about his age to get into the army. Two years later, he decided it didn't suit him, so he lied to get out. He was discharged in 1975 after claiming he had schizophrenia and was hearing voices. The army sent him a disability check every month, which he used to go to college. Martin had big plans despite his humble beginnings. Some guys learned to play guitar and join a band to get girls. Martin McNeil thought about all the money and pretty women he could get if he were a doctor. Yes, that was the career for him. There was just the small matter of his bad grades. A little thing like the truth never stopped him before, and he certainly wasn't going to limit himself now just because his grades were less than stellar. He applied to a medical school in Mexico with a fake transcript. After six months there, he faked his way into a medical school in California with another fake transcript. It worked like a charm. Martin McNeil became Dr. McNeil in 1984. When he noticed how many hot women lawyers were pulling in, he decided decided he needed a law degree too, but he didn't come by it honestly. While working at Brigham Young University Clinic, he faked his way through BYU Law School. In this case, truth is by far stranger than fiction. Martin McNeil practiced osteopathic medicine for years, even though serious criminal charges followed him every step of the way. In 1990, he was banned from Medicaid billing for 12 years after getting caught for fraud. Accusations of sexual assault, misconduct, and just plain old being a bad doctor got him kicked out of BYU Health Center in 1998. But that didn't stop the fake doctor. The governor of Utah appointed him as medical director of the Utah State Developmental Center in 2000. While Martin seemed to have it together on the outside, you didn't have to look far to see the edges unraveling. For one thing, there were the suicide threats. Maybe it was Martin's way of asking for help, but then again, Again, his timing was incredibly coincidental. Every time he got caught doing something wrong, he threatened to take his own life. Listen to this. In 1994, Martin threatened to kill himself after getting caught having an affair with one of his patients. In 2000, the same year he landed his cushy job at the Utah Developmental Center, Martin threatened to kill Michelle and himself with a butcher knife. Apparently, Michelle caught him online looking at porn. His 14-year-old son, Damien, had to wrestle the knife out of his hand. Five years later, Martin got caught with more porn and threatened to kill himself again. Now, porn was only the tip of the iceberg. Martin had lots of other women on the side. Two of them would prove to be more than just a one-night stand. Anna Osborne and Gypsy Willis. Anna ran a laser hair removal clinic. She met Martin in 2005 while he served as a consultant. Anna was going through a bitter divorce, and Martin offered his services as a liaison between her and her husband. He was a lawyer, after all. Their relationship turned sexual pretty quickly, and Martin didn't hold back during pillow talk. He boasted about how easy it was to kill someone with the right combination of meds. Nobody would ever know. It would look totally natural like a heart attack. He offered to kill her husband for her, but she figured he was just joking. At least, she hoped so. If Anna was just a fling, Gypsy Willis was Martin's one true love. They met online in November 2005. He slid in her DMs, introducing himself as a doctor and a lawyer. He was tall, handsome, and well-educated. Gypsy was a 29-year-old nursing student who didn't mind being the other woman. But before too long, Martin decided his perfect life 
wasn't so perfect anymore, not if Gypsy couldn't be in it. He thought he was juggling his girlfriends and his family without anyone knowing, but he was wrong. Michelle had her suspicions. In February 2007, Michelle combed through his phone records. Martin was acting strange, stranger than normal, and she wanted to see who he'd been calling. Gypsy's name and number kept popping up. Michelle confronted him about the affair, and he promised to break it off, but only if Michelle promised to do a little work on herself, too. Martin was obsessed with looks and physical appearance. He was a regular at the tanning salon, and he wanted Michelle to get a facelift to make her look younger. She was hesitant at first. It was too short notice. If she was going under the knife, she wanted to lower her blood pressure first, maybe prepare a little more. Martin insisted. She'd be fine. There was nothing to worry about. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Michelle reluctantly agreed, thinking the facelift could help their marriage. They met with the surgeon who would perform Michelle's procedure. Before she went under, Martin pulled the doctor aside and handed him a laundry list of medications to prescribe. Martin said he'd be the one caring for Michelle during her recovery. His medical background didn't raise any red flags. The surgery was a success. Just as Martin asked, the doctor wrote prescriptions for Valium, Ambien, Phenergan, Percocet and Lortab. They should never be taken together, but the doctor figured Martin would be in charge of the meds at home, so there was nothing to worry about. On April 3rd, 2007, Martin brought Michelle home from the hospital. She was all doped up. Her eyes were covered in bandages. He had a pocket full of murder weapons and another con to pull. Alexis was home for spring break and remembered her mother looking pretty bad. She wanted to help immediately, but Martin hustled her out of the bedroom, insisting insisting on taking care of his wife. The next morning, Alexis found her mom in a zombie-like state. She confronted Martin, who admitted he may have given her too many pills. He said Michelle threw up the first batch, so he had to give her more. Shocked that her doctor father would force pain meds down her mother's throat, Alexis told her dad to let her handle her mother's medication from now on. In private, Michelle asked to feel each of the pills before Alexis gave them to her. She still couldn't see, but she'd be able to tell which pills were which by their unique markings. She didn't trust Martin. She knew he was up to something. Michelle pulled Alexis close and said, If something happens to me, make sure it wasn't your dad. Michelle looked healthier as the days went by. Alexis felt better about leaving her and returning to med school. They spoke for their final time around 8.45 a.m. When Alexis asked her mother how dad was treating her, she happily told her Martin was sweet and loving. There was nothing to worry about. Hours later, Michelle was dead. Alexis got a strange message from her father on the afternoon of April 11th, 2007. He said Michelle wasn't getting out of bed and asked if Alexis could call her. When she called, Martin picked up the phone. He said, your mom, she's in the tub, she's not breathing, I've called an ambulance, and hung up. The first thing Alexis wanted to do was count her mother's medication. She knew how much she had, how much she should be taking, and how many pills should be left. Unfortunately, Damien's girlfriend flushed the pills before Alexis had the chance. The police called Michelle's death an accident. Alexis had darker suspicions. She confided in her older sister, Rachel, but neither one of them wanted to believe their father would have murdered their sweet and loving mother. Martin McNeil lived to push the envelope. He loved to see how much he could get away with, but when he told his daughters to go to church and pray to God to send them a nanny to watch the little ones, he took it too far. They had buried their mother only three days earlier, but they did as their father asked and went to the Mormon temple to pray for a nanny. As they were leaving, a woman they'd never met came over and introduced herself. Martin pretended he was meeting her for the first time, but in reality, he knew her very, very well. It was his mistress, Gypsy. She introduced herself as Jillian, but Alexis wasn't stupid. Jillian was actually Gypsy Willis. Now, Alexis warned Martin against bringing Gypsy into their home, but he didn't care. Less than a month later, Martin's mistress moved in. She didn't act much like a nanny. She didn't take care of the kids. She didn't clean the house. She didn't cook. And she spent every night in bed with Martin. Rachel and Alexis demanded to know what this woman did do. In answer, Martin threatened to throw them out of the house if they weren't nice to the new nanny. And that was fine with them. Any doubt they'd ever had about what their father was capable of was gone. 
With the help of their mother's sister, the daughters focused on getting the police to investigate Michelle's death. Meanwhile, Martin hatched another scam. Gypsy was thousands of dollars in debt. Martin had a solution. Her creditors would never find her if she changed her identity. And he happened to have a clean identity to offer, that of his 16-year-old adopted daughter, Giselle. Martin sent her packing back to her biological family in Ukraine so his mistress could steal her name and social security number. He told Giselle she'd only be gone for the summer. She never heard back from him. And back home in Utah, Martin was busy trying to find a new home for her three other adopted sisters. Almost a year went by until her cousin Jill came to find her. When Jill arrived, she found Giselle living in absolute poverty with her birth family. Back in the States, Gypsy was living the good life with Giselle's identity. Martin even changed his will, leaving everything to her and only one dollar each to his kids. Sometimes, he'd claim the new Giselle McNeil was his wife. Other times, he'd claim she was his daughter. When Jill brought the real Giselle home from Ukraine, Martin and Gypsy's false identity scam unraveled overnight. They both pled guilty to federal charges in 2009 and spent time in separate prisons. While Martin sat behind bars, his daughters made headway on proving he was responsible for their mother's death. The chief medical examiner agreed to review Michelle's toxicology report. While none of the meds in her system were at toxic levels, the combination could have easily killed her. The examiner also noted that Michelle wouldn't have been able to take the medications herself. Investigators dug deeper into Martin's background and quickly uncovered his web of lies. His entire career was built on fake transcripts. Even worse, Martin was still getting disability payments for his brief stint in the military. It was all thanks to his silver tongue. Martin finished up his sentence for fraud, forgery, and identity theft in July 2012. No doubt he had ambitions to start over, maybe this time as an astronaut or a nuclear physicist. Who knows what else his imagination could come up with. But he never got the chance to lie his way into a new beginning. In August 2012, he was officially charged with Michelle's murder. Sadly, Damien wasn't there to celebrate with his sisters. He committed suicide a few years after Michelle's death. His surviving siblings testified against their father. It must have been a truly cathartic experience. They laid out his history of lying and cheating, and get this, he had also started molesting Alexis six weeks after killing her mother. He was found guilty on that charge in a separate trial. More than seven years after Michelle's death, her surviving family got the answers they'd been searching for. Martin had pumped his wife full of drugs that he knew would be near impossible to detect, then left her in the bathtub to die while he went to work to establish his alibi. It was an almost perfect murder, and he might have gotten away with it if it wasn't for his kid's persistence. In 2013, he was found guilty of murder. After serving two years in jail, Martin McNeil was found dead in his jail cell on April 9, 2017. He had finally found a situation he couldn't fake his way out of. As for Gypsy, she's never been charged with any crimes other than identity theft, and she's kept a low profile ever since the trial. The girls made it their mission to scrub their father's dark name from their lives, literally and figuratively. They had their father's name removed from their mother's gravestone. Alexis got married and adopted her three younger sisters. She also changed her last name from McNeil to Summers, Michelle's maiden name. She said, I don't want to be Dr. McNeil. I don't want to have any part of my dad. Can you blame her? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.